Nathaniel Rich, Losing Earth, The Decade We Could Have Stopped Climate Change. In Losing Earth, The Decade We Could Have Stopped Climate Change, Nathaniel Rich reveals how key figures in science, politics, and environmentalism tried to stop climate change between 1979 and 1989. The book takes readers through the challenges faced by these individuals as they attempted to bring attention to the threats of global warming, formulating potential solutions, and persuading lawmakers to take appropriate action. Along the way, the book also uncovers the indifference, indecision, and corporate pushback that stymied these efforts. Ultimately, Losing Earth paints a vivid picture of a crucial, yet failed opportunity to address climate change before it became an urgent crisis. The frightening report that warned us about climate change. It is not news that the world's climate is in peril. What may surprise some readers is that scientists have warned about the dangers of man-made climate change since 1979. That fateful year, Rafe Pomerantz, an environmentalist, and Gordon MacDonald of the Jason Scientific Think Tank discover a report that predicted that human activity would cause greenhouse gas emissions and widespread ecological damage. MacDonald and Pomerantz used their connections to push for action on climate change and succeeded in gathering politicians, meteorologists, and top scientific minds at a conference where NASA scientist, Jim Hansen, presented computer models confirming the report's predictions. The conference led to a final report referred to as the Charney Report, Carbon Dioxide and Climate, a Scientific Assessment. This critical document outlined the consequences of inaction, which led to disastrous results, including a three-degree increase in the world's average temperature. Despite reports and warnings that date back to 1979, we have failed to make necessary changes to prevent a catastrophic outcome. A Failed Attempt at Environmental Action In October 1980, a team of politicians, energy experts, and environmentalists met at the Pink Palace in Florida to discuss policy proposals for tackling climate change. However, the conference ended with no consensus or policy form due to disagreement over urgent and decisive action. The conference attendees were divided between those who advocated for strong and immediate action and those who favored a more moderate approach. Despite the urgent need for action, the inability to agree on recommended policies resulted in delayed legislation. The inability to bridge the gap resulted in fossil fuel companies utilizing their economic resources to delay action. The conference served as a reminder that the transition to a greener future requires significant unity and decisive action. Making climate change a political issue This summary tells the story of how activists leveraged congressional hearings to make climate change a popular political issue in the early 1980s. The article highlights how the election of Ronald Reagan, an aggressively right-wing president, put environmental regulation at risk and how activists like John Pomerantz saw an opportunity to build public support for legislation by leveraging the work of NASA scientist James Hansen. Hansen and other scientists testified before Congress on the urgency of reducing carbon emissions, but despite some initial momentum, no policies or regulations were passed. Nonetheless, the hearings marked a turning point in bringing climate change to the public's attention and paved the way for future advocacy efforts. Ozone Crisis and Climate Change Movement In 1983, the National Academy of Sciences warned about the dire consequences of climate change, but the Reagan administration downplayed the threat. However, the discovery of a hole in the ozone layer in 1985 brought the issue to the forefront, leading to the passing of the Montreal Protocol. The quick and effective action taken by governments in response to the ozone crisis served as a positive model for environmentalists who believed that a similar approach could be used to mitigate carbon emissions and slow down climate change. Climate Action in the Mid-1980s In the mid-1980s, climate action was a real possibility, and a bipartisan group of senators called upon Reagan to negotiate a climate change accord with the USSR. In 1985, Pomerantz discussed the urgent need for action on climate change with Republican staffer Curtis Moore. While Moore agreed carbon emissions were a significant issue, he explained that without an attainable solution, no politician would take up the challenge. However, 
With the successful fight against CFCs still fresh, Pomerantz held on to the hope that tackling carbon output was possible through a smart politician pushing for an international treaty. Pomerantz went on to become the country's first full-time climate action lobbyist and convinced Republican Senator John Chaffee to hold more climate change hearings. The effort paid off as more politicians addressed the issue, and in March 1988, a group of 41 senators called upon Reagan to negotiate a climate change accord with the USSR. The negotiations resulted in a bilateral agreement where both countries promised to cooperate on the climate change issue. Although there were no concrete regulations or plans put in place, the event made climate change a popular issue that even international rivals could get behind. As time was running out and 1988 was already the hottest year on record, the agreement was an essential step towards fighting climate change. The Fossil Fuel Industries Plan In the late 80s, the world's first-ever international benchmarks for climate reduction were adopted by representatives of 46 countries in Toronto. However, this mild climate change action was met with strong pushback from the fossil fuel industry, who organized meetings to delay change by creating controversy and questioning the science. Despite having internal memos documenting the reality of climate change, they put money into PR campaigns to give the impression that there was no scientific consensus. By the end of the year, the entire industry had seemingly settled on one coordinated talking point, more research is necessary. Abandoning duty on climate action In 1989, the U.S. government neglected its responsibility to act on climate change as revealed in James Hansen's scuttled congressional testimony under the Bush administration. The Office of Management and Budget ordered Hansen to censor his notes, indicating the administration's apathy towards carbon policy. The chief of staff, John Sununu, also played a role in disrupting the conference that aimed to regulate industrial emissions, ensuring its failure. The Republican Party adopted climate change denial as their position, contributing to an increase in global warming. In the end, losing Earth demonstrates how the pioneers of climate change activism in the late 20th century encountered roadblocks and suffered defeats in their efforts to implement preventative measures. Despite the scientific consensus on the dangers of human-induced climate change, a combination of political inertia, corporate interests, and a widespread resistance to change led to the inability to adopt significant policies to address the issue. As a result, the world finds itself today in a much more perilous state than it could have been had action been taken earlier. Rich's book serves as a powerful reminder of the urgency of tackling climate change and the need for determination cooperation, and innovation to face this global challenge head-on.